So the next speaker that I'd like to uh, introduce is Dr. Stephen Porges, a professor of psychiatry and the director of the Brain Body Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Dr. Porges has published more than 200 scientific articles across disciplines. Uh, in 1994, he proposed the polyvagal theory, which is the genesis of his celebrity in my intellectual life. Um, <laughs> the idea that the 10th cranial nerve the vagus nerve plays a privileged role in affiliative motivation was revolutionary in its time and has prompted a legacy of research, some done by my own postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Dacher Keltner, who is the faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center and uh, deeply regrets not being able to join us here in Telluride. Um, one of his most promising doctoral students, Jennifer Steller, is here in the audience, and she's as excited as I am to be under the same roof as Dr. Porges. Um, Dr. Porges' work has led to remarkable innovative thinking uh, and and the development of translatable tools from revolutionary medical approaches to treating neurological disease and mood disorder to um, some more exploratory products that I might um, be the only one who has the privilege of having uh, been pitched to about this, but a cutaneous vagal stimulator that would make people nicer. Um, not sure how Dr. Portis would feel about that one, but I'd be curious to hear. Um, so once again, with the utmost respect, I'd like to invite Dr. Stephen Portis up to the podium. So it's a great pleasure to be here, um, and I want to thank uh, the, the organizing group for inviting me. This is not my normal uh, venue. I don't normally talk to, I talk to compassionate people, but they tend not to be compassion researchers. Um, my talk actually fits in very nicely after the first two presentations because it treats evolution from a different perspective, but it also focuses on uh, basically very core processes in the body upon which uh, psychological processes such as compassion may reside. So it's the notion that uh, I really want people to think differently and not really focus solely on psychological processes, but on the underlying physiology. And that's really what the theme of this talk will be. So the theme of the talk really is that the, I'm going to have to re put my glasses on because the print is small. The neural origin for compassion is uniquely mammalian, so we're really not even talking humans at this stage, and is dependent upon the phylogenetic changes in the autonomic nervous system from reptiles to mammals. And this is really what I want you to start thinking because humans uh, are not only unique uh, ma mammals, but they share also in their nervous system some of the circuits from older, phylogenetically older vertebrae, so reptilian circuits, and we recruit these older circuits when we be go into defensive states. And that's going to be one of the main themes here, that concepts like compassion and altruism and even positive social behavior cannot occur unless we are in safe places with more uh, and can turn off our defensive systems. So compassion is neurophysiologically incompatible with judgmental, evaluative, and defensive behaviors. And feelings that recruit physiologically older or phylogenetically older neural circuits regulating autonomic function make it incompatible. We can't reach these psychological states. And this reaches back to some of the statements that were made in the previous talk, that this is a core process that we're looking for upon which higher psychological processes can occur. And finally, the effectiveness of many of the methodologies that come from alternative cultures, Eastern thought, and what we're learning a lot from Buddhism, such as meditation, listening, chanting, posture, and breath on fostering mental states and health is due to a common phylogenetic change in the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system. So often, so we can actually deconstruct a lot of these practices and we can actually explain what they're doing. And when they are recruiting this new mammalian circuit that enables us to stay calm to socially engage and to reach and to have other psychological experiences. So in a very uh, a short summary, what I often say is if you can recruit the circuit, you can, e you can experience certain aspects, true aspects of being human, including the appreciation of aesthetics. So it's not merely that you're gonna be social, compassionate, but your whole life will be very different. Now, I'm not going to go through all this, but there are major points here, and that is that the nervous system and the physiology in our periphery changed, and the regulation of these peripheral structures changed uh, in the transition from reptiles to mammals. And all these circuits, if you were to look through them, 
have been researched with people who are studying or researched by people who study compassion, altruism, and positive social behavior. But they're merely picking on, it's like looking at a diamond and they're grabbing one facet. The true core of that diamond is this transition from reptile to mammal. And if you look at those uh, things that have changed and move it to the next uh, construct, and that is you realize that bidirectional interactions among the areas in the brainstem that regulate this myelinated vagus and several cranial nerves that regulate the striate muscles of the face result in a face-heart connection with portals that regulate state. In a sense, we become safe and comfortable because our, the muscles of our face work. It can be recruited through breath. It can be recruited through the striate muscles of our face, and they link with the myelinate vagus that calms us, turns off stress responses, downregulates uh, all the uh, defensive systems, and enables us, us to engage and come closer to other human beings, and to actually respond to other people and cue them in a way that makes us safe. And those of you interested in alternative methodologies realize that this system provides portals of manipulation. So it enables the voice to change autonomic state. So we can actually sing or chant. And if we got into the deep levels of physiology, we'd realize that the vocalization, the intonation of vocalization, not only conveys to the other that we are safe to come close to or we're in pain, but actually is stimulating our vagal system because of a nerve called a recurrent laryngeal nerve that is going to vibrate when we chant, and it's going to affect how our myelinated viscera, our myelinated vagus is calming down our viscera. I can, we'll use the word myelinated vagus because that's uniquely mammalian, and that is accessible through using face. So even when we are in safe places and listen, our ability to listen, to pull in information, feeds back and calms us down. Our ability to utilize especially the upper part of the face, the, the striated muscle of the face, calms us down. The way we breathe, if we extend the duration of our exhalations and extend our phrases, we calm down. Because during exhalation, the myelinate vagus has greater impact on our viscera. And many of the uh, meditation strategies deal with breathing. And of course, posture, heart relationships are also triggering these systems. These are all portals that become available because of that transition from reptile to mammal. Now, I'm making assumptions. I am not a researcher of compassion. Uh, but let's assume that to experience and express compassion turn, requires turning off defenses. If we make that assumption, how do we feel determines whether we become friends, lovers, or enemies. And this is really, I use other slides to describe this, basically saying that our physiology colors our perception of the world. So that when we're in different physiological states, the same stimuli trigger different physiological responses with different psychological experiences. Our feelings are dependent upon these physiological states, and the physiological states can be measured by the autonomic nervous system. The unique part of the whole model is that the autonomic nervous system is not solely peripheral. It's connected to our brain. Our visualizations, our thoughts, our facial muscles, our listening, our cognitions, our reactions to others can be transmitted in a directional downward from brain to body, but also our body can promote information upward. So gastric distension, palpitations of the heart, this information is going upward changing our cognitive states and our ability to relate to the world. So it's this bi-directionality. The vagus is this primary portal, and it has 80% of its fibers are sensory. It's reading our body, sending information to our brainstem, radiating from the brainstem up to cortex, enabling availability for the areas of the brain that Richie was talking about yesterday. Defense turns off this mammalian uh, all the mammalian innovations of the autonomic nervous system, and especially the face-heart connection. And all of you, even though the lights are dim, I can't get all the good feedback I want to have, uh, faces become blank or flat when people become scared or challenged or in pain. And what that is telling you, it's really a, a portal to understanding the neural regulation of the person's viscera 
they're wearing a physiograph or a polygraph on their face. So when the face becomes flat, neural tone to the heart decreases. And when the face becomes animated, especially the upper part of the face, then the vagal activity to the heart is calming. In fact, we all know this intuitively, but there is a physiology to this. Compassion requires turning off biobehavioral defense systems in the dyad, and I'm going to focus on the dyad, to enable both compassionate, be, uh, compassionate, the compassionate individual, hmm, both the compassionate individual and the other to feel safe, to be proximal, and to enable phys physical contact. So the real issue here is how do we get close together? When you approach a person, you may say, look, I'm really a caring person, and I am now doing it out of duty. I'm coming close to the person. But that person will understand biologically that it's duty and not love and compassion because the face will reflect it, the movement will reflect it, and the person who is the target will react, rather than feeling safe, will react defensively. So the delivery of service in a medical model or a healthcare model requires the person to be warm, loving, and caring for the target person to be receptive of that type of support. So this all is based upon a theory that I developed called the polyvagal theory that emphasizes the phylogenetic development and changes in the autonomic nervous system and emphasizes the transition from reptiles to mammals. And we have to understand who or what type of reptile was our true ancestor. And it was a, a, basically a tortoise, a turtle. And so we started thinking about what are the primary defense uh, responses of turtles. Uh, and what we find out, of course, those of you who uh, either know people who have experienced uh, life threat situations realize that shutdown behaviors is really what had happened. They basically became a turtle. And what we need to do is understand these behaviors and the physiological consequences. But the important part of the model is not merely that there are the phylogenetic shifts, but the phylogenetic shifts provide adaptive physiological states that, support, that are actually neural platforms for different uh, behaviors. And that one neural platform supports safety. Another neural platform supports the defense behaviors for danger. And a third neural platform enables us to deal with life threat. And life threat is different than danger. Danger requires mobilization and fight-flight behaviors. Life threat, we don't have the option. And what we'll learn in a few moments is what does our body do when we can't escape from impending death? So we need to understand these systems so that we can enable human interactions to promote health, growth, and restoration. So the polyvagal theory really has three major points. The first is that evolution provides an organizing principle to understand neuroregulation of the human autonomic nervous system as an enabler of positive social behavior. And these three neural circuits form a phylogenetically ordered response hierarchy. And it's a lot of words and it's a little bit complicated, but higher. basically we use our newest circuits first. And those of you who read uh, Damasio's book, Descartes' Error, you know, understand there was a set of principles called Jacksonian principles that describe that when we injure areas of the brain, the newer circuits disinhibit the older ones. Well, the polyvagal theory takes that Jacksonian principle and basically says on an adaptive level, we use our newest components of the autonomic nervous system first, and when they don't serve to put us in safe environments, we use older and older circuits. So they provide adaptive responses to safe, dangerous, and life-threatening environments. And how do we get there? How does our nervous system know that it should go to these places? And we live in a world where we're dominated with certain types of constructs. And we say, well, if you knew danger was, uh, if you knew you were going into a dangerous environment, why didn't your body go into that state to protect you? Well, it's not a cognitive response. And it's not a perceptual response. I had to come up with a new term. And I had to use this term, which I call neuroception, which is the body's ability to detect risk outside the realm of awareness. And when it detects risk, it shifts us into these different states. Now, you all have friends who when they, uh, they might stand in front of a crowd like this and they can't talk because their neuroception sees it as life threat. They may actually pass out. Other people's voices may be unable to be modulated, just get high squeaky voices 
because they're in a fight-flight state. Other people will be more engaging, even though you can't see faces out there. Um, that I need the feedback, really, <laughs> and it's very hard <laughs> because, uh, okay, I could have sent a video, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but the neuroception is really our body does this, and when we develop relationships, we're dealing with the bidirectionality, the reciprocal relationships, and how that changes our physiological state and the physiological state of the other. And this really uh, summarizes the whole theory in a very simple model. We're taking cues from both the external world and our internal physiology. Our nervous system interprets it. It's not aware. It's not an aware response. It's not a conscious response. It is a neuroceptive response, and it basically triggers different physiological states. It puts us into a state of safety. And when we're there, we can spontaneously engage others. <clears throat> Our voice has prosody, it's not hoarse. Um, and we have good facial expressivity. And when we do that, we have actually are supporting visceral homeostasis, so it supports our health. And this is what you talk about being relaxed, enjoying the company of, the, of another. But really what it's about, it's using, being in a physiological state in which you can use another person in the dyadic interaction to help you regulate your state. Now. If the nervous system detects features that are not safe, then the nervous system will go into a more mobilized, muscle tension increases, heart rate uh, increases, the vagal tone is withdrawn, and you're now prepared for a fight-flight behavior. Most academics live daily in that state, okay? <laughs> um, and if they're not, they're not there long, right? Um, and the real issue in our society is how Mobilized can you keep people so they're productive and mobilized, pushing levers, doing studies, collecting data. Uh, how much pressure can you put on them before they basically shut down? And it's just a metaphor because society is always pushing people to its limits. Because if the nervous system detects uh, the demands as life threat, it will just stop. The person will just crash. And what we have to understand is we need, we need to downregulate mobilization to put people in this safe state. And when we're in this safe state, then we can be socially engaging, we can be creative, we can be bold, and we can develop new ideas. Now for your uh, neurobiology, thank you. See, it's much better with lights, a little social behavior there. <laughs> I feel much more comfortable. Okay. Everyone in this audience loves anatomy, so here is your anatomy lesson. <laughs> the, body, the body has three structures. It has a head, it has an internal viscera, and it has a trunk and limbs. The polyvagal theory basically says phylogenetically we start off as a viscera, basically a tube that had an old vagus, okay? It's an unmyelinated vagus, and in mammals, it really regulates organs below the diaphragm but it still has impact on superdiaphragmatic organs like our heart. And we can see the effect. Here is the mouse. Is the mouse dead? Probably not. The mouse is in a life threat reaction. We call this death feigning. Do you think the mouse's cognition said, hey, if I'm going to survive, I better just pretend that I'm dead? Basically, the mouse has passed out. And in passing out, it loses muscle tone and the cat loses interest. But this physiological response we can see in people who pass out, and we can also see people who go into that state when they are in life threat situations in which they cannot mobilize to get away or if the size differential is so great that fighting won't help. And this has a lot to do with abuse, rape, and things like that that occur, where people don't have the option to get away, they can get hurt. Now, through phylogeny, we then start to develop another autonomic nervous system, one that support limb movements, motion, it enabled us to fight, to flee, to fight. And then finally, with mammals, mammals uniquely got another autonomic nervous system, a myelinated vagus that was linked to brainstem areas that control all the striated muscles of the face and head and had lots of cortical connections. And this system enabled people to be interactive and regulate that upper part of the face to cue others that they're safe to come close to. And this had a major impact upon the viscera. 
and it enabled mammals who had, had to use other mammals to nurse, to develop cooperative lives, to, in a sense, be safe with another, to function. And so what we can see as we look at these pictures, we see certain face-to-face -face interactions. And we, if we, now, we now know what to look at. We look at the upper part of the face, we look at the eyes, and we look at the orbicularis oculi, the orbital muscle around the eye. And when that shows those little crinkles, it also tells us that the middle ear muscles are tensing, and now the person can hear human voice very well, turning off the response to low-frequency sounds that are triggering predator. And we can see this, and when we do that, we're turning off our vigilance for predator. Now, the whole notion of a dyad being very important in regulating physiological state is not an original idea. Myron Hofer talked about this a few decades ago, and you can see that with mother and infant, the dyadic interaction does help individuals feel comfortable and safe. But it is not solely a, excuse me, a human response. So if we look at koala bears and we look at this, what is our physiological response as we look at this? Do we feel the same type of warmth and compassion and feeling and safety? Here is a koala bear that was rescued after a fire. And you see the hand holding, the eye to eye and the face to face, the cross species, compassion and engagement. So the first point is that if we were to talk about a neural love code, there would be one first phase is the importance of the face-to-face -face interaction. But that is merely the first part of the story. And the face-to-face -face interaction is this notion of tying together the vagus, which is that 10th cranial nerve, with the nerves, the pathways, that regulate the striated muscles of the face and head. And this provides an integrated social engagement system. This is, this is clearly organized because the column of, in the brainstem that, that regulates these striated muscles exits at those different cranial nerves. So when you memorize those cranial nerves, you didn't realize that they were columns from the brainstem that were just exiting. So this is actually an integrated system called special visceral efferents. And you can see that now, when you are safe, you can be immobilized without fear. I took, this, I took this picture in Kauai. These are monk seals. You see the commonality. And again, we go cross species. And when you see the baby hippopotamus with the turtle, what are you looking at? You're looking at the face of the hippopotamus because the muscles are giving you the same clues to your neuroception of the animal being safe. So we now have a second phase of that uh, love code, and that is the importance of physical contact while immobilizing without fear. So taking that immobilization response and taking it away from a life threat and using it now to support growth, health, and restoration and when Sue Carter speaks, she'll talk a little about that because oxytocin is involved during this phase. Immobilization without fear can only occur following the establishment of safety via the social engagement system. Without feeling safe, immobilization triggers the threat experiences or life threat experiences. So we can't just give social support or give care without understanding that the recipient has to be a recipient, has to feel safe with it. So social engagement and immobilization without fear are features of compassion and compassionate behaviors. At least that's my uh, opinion or at least perspective. Bodily feelings influence our awareness of others and, uh, and, and either potentiate spontaneous social engagement behaviors and feelings of compassion or displace spontaneous social behaviors and feelings of compassion with defensive reactions and judgmental feelings. And now to kind of summarize, and this is really, I really appreciated being invited because it forced me to take my ideas and my model and see how did it fit with more uh, contemporary research and research views on compassion. And I was left with 
these final two statements, and that, and this is my definition, and it doesn't necessarily generalize to all the definitions of compassion, but from a phylogenetic perspective, compassion is a manifestation of our biological need to engage and to bond with others, and compassion is a component of our biological quest for safety in the proximity of another. Thank you. <laughs>